So last week we began our series uh, looking at the biblical, the poetry of the Bible. Last week we started in the book of Job. Uh, this week we're going to be transitioning a little bit. Um, so consider with me, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about uh, the book of Psalms? Perhaps it's a time in your life when you spent a lot of time there. Perhaps it's a certain psalm that you love to read when you're feeling a certain way. But it, it is a bit of a transition where last week we were looking at the book of Job as more of a, a narrative, uh, speaking about Job and his family and his losses that he experienced. And this week we're transitioning over to the Hebrew poetry of the Psalms, where we're probably going to spend a few weeks there looking through uh, different psalms uh, throughout the book. But again, as we did last week, before we dive right into our passage this morning, we'll consider the, the book of Psalms as a whole, uh, looking at some of the background information and considering some of those things before we dive right in. As I said already, I'm sure many of us have a favorite or a most beloved psalm or a specific verse from a psalm that maybe you memorized or that you like to remember your, or remind yourself with. May, many of us are familiar with Psalm 23, uh, other psalms like Psalm 63, Psalm 119, and, and others. Um, and considering the book of Psalms, this is what my Bible had to say in introduction, which I think is helpful to consider the overall book. It said, The Psalms give God's people the words to express their emotions and the words to bring their experiences before God. And throughout the book of Psalms, we see a, a variety of emotions, including love and adoration toward God, sorrow over sin, dependence on God in difficult circumstances, the battle of fear and trust, walking with God even when the way seems dark, thankfulness for God's care, devotion to the Word of God, and confidence in the eventual triumph of God's purposes for the world. So as you hear some of these things, as you consider some of these emotions that, that the authors were, that were working through as they wrote these psalms, I'm sure many of us have experienced these in our own lives. So as we have these experiences, as we have these emotions, and as we read through the psalms, it helps us to feel connected with the scriptures, really, with that emotional language. And I'm sure many of us have experienced that throughout our lives, that feeling that connection to the author, to where they are and to where we are, and working together with that. And I'm sure many of us know that many of the psalms were penned by King David. Uh, he appears in 73 of the titles of the psalms. Other authors include the sons of Korah, uh, Asaph, Solomon, and others. But my prayer is that as we look through some of these psalms over the coming weeks, you'll be able to consider yourself how you can empathize with the author, considering how you have those same feelings, those same emotions, that you can be real with those feelings. Admit your emotions. Admit the times where maybe you're struggling with, with faith, where you're struggling with sin, struggling with the things that the psalmists struggled with. But also let the theology of the psalms dictate your own life and the own, your own direction that you are heading and consider where God is desiring to take you this summer and beyond as we look at these words. So this morning, as we start the book of Psalms, we're going to look at Psalm 1. We're going to start at the beginning. So if you'd open up to Psalm 1, I'll read from there now. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So these are the words that we'll be considering this morning. It may just be a short psalm. There's just six short verses, as many of the psalms are. But it is a good place to start because there is so much in these six verses. And this psalm really uh, gives a picture of where the whole book is going to go. Again, from the study notes in my Bible, it says about this particular psalm that Psalm 1 serves as the gateway to the entire book of Psalms, stressing that those who would worship God must embrace His law. 
So in this chapter, you may have noticed, you see uh, three contrasting statements. There's verse 1 and 2, 3 and 4, or 5 and 6, each working together, each setting up a contrast of the wicked or the sinful person on one side and the blessed or the righteous person on the other side. So we will look at each statement in itself, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and consider them individually as we work our way through this psalm. So at the beginning of this first verse, uh, you see the word blessed. Blessed is the man, and then it goes on. So the first word blessed, what does it mean to be blessed? Last week, uh, we heard Job use this term as he, after all that he had endured, after all that he had lost, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. We heard that last week. We heard that song last week as well. And when we hear it used in that context, we are blessing God's name. We are holding him up. We're holding him up in reverence, worshiping him, honoring him. But when we're speaking about a man being blessed, when we're speaking of ourselves being blessed, this is not necessarily what is meant. Because we're not desiring ourselves to be held up high in reverence. We're not desiring to worship or honor ourselves necessarily. But rather, if you are desiring to be blessed, we are desiring to hold the Lord up in reverence. And this word blessed, you may or may not know, has taken up an interesting connotation in the last several years, especially among the younger generations. I think of uh, many people that use it as a caption on an Instagram post or social media post, putting hashtag blessed. It's, it's been a way to kind of brag on what you have or brag about how good your life is. A simple caption on social media saying, my parents just bought me a new car, hashtag blessed. Just bought a new house, hashtag blessed. Going on like that. That's become the connotation that many people would associate with, especially younger people. But is that what is intended here? Is that what we're seeking? Are we seeking material blessing? And are we to expect that the Lord is going to bless us with earthly riches? I, I hope not. I hope that's not what we're expecting. Because as we saw last week, as we looked at Job, we saw what can happen with material things and the things of this world that you may be rich one day and they can be gone in an instant and you're left with nothing. But I like the definition given by Merriam-Webster for the word blessed that I found, which is enjoying the bliss of heaven. To be blessed is enjoying the bliss of heaven. Not enjoying the bliss of a new boat, new house, new car, but the bliss of heaven. Being focused on heavenly things, even while on the earth. Uh, Basil the Great, an early church father, had this to say about this first verse. He said, For truly blessed is goodness itself toward which all things look, which all things desire, an unchangeable nature, lordly dignity, calm existence, a happy way of life in which there is no alteration, which no change touches, a flowing fount, abundant grace, inexhaustible treasure. And what a blessing that sounds like, to be living a life in that way, to be blessed by God. So we look at this verse and we consider how can we experience this blessing? How can we be blessed people? How can we be the blessed man? Uh, the first verse starts out not by telling us what to do, but what not to do. In order to be blessed, it says, Walk not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So considering these words, consider ourselves. Who, who do you spend your time with? Who do you surround yourselves with? Whether or not we want to admit it, the people we are with do impact us and impact how we live, the choices that we make. And much has been discussed over the last couple of years as we went through COVID and different things about what fellowship really means. And uh, as we went through certain things, as churches are, some churches are still going through those things. That could watching a church service on your couch by yourself really be considered church? Because how can you experience that true fellowship online just through a screen? Yes, it may be possible. There are ways that churches have looked and have done that. But it's certainly challenging and much more challenging than being in person, living life together. An important part of church is fellowship. It has always been the fabric of the church from the beginning. As you look at the early church in the book of Acts. Spending time with other believers. Living life together. Encouraging one another. Holding one each other accountable. Uh, worshiping God together as we have been this morning, mourning with each other as we experience a loss, celebrating with each other 
as we have blessings that come upon us. And what a blessing it is to share all these things together as a church, as a body of believers. I know that having potlucks, we've had a couple of potlucks, and that's been a blessing, a time of fellowship for many. But, but what about the rest of the week when we're not here on Sundays? Who are you with? Do you have other Christian friends? Or do you have people from church that you are with, that you spend time with? I know sometimes this can be a challenge. For me now, and especially thinking back to my teenage years, I went to public school. All the friends I had were from school. Uh, almost none of them were Christian. So having these friends and spending time with them all the time with my teammates from football affected everything I did, affected the choices I made, the things I said, the movies I watched, how I treated others, what I did with my free time. And looking back, it certainly impacted my lack of interest in church, my lack of interest in youth group, interest in the Bible, and really all things spiritual. I went to church with my family, but other than that, I had no interest. And I'm certainly thankful as I look back at that time, and even though I was spending almost all my time with non-believers, I still can look back and see those that reached out to me, pastors from my church, my parents, and those that encouraged me, even in that time, to still get involved, uh, to go to youth events, even when I didn't want to be there, and eventually uh, getting involved as a youth leader, which led to me going to Bible school. So even in that time of darkness and difficulty, there were still those that proactively looked and reached out to me, encouraging me uh, to be involved. And then going to Bible school, what a shift that was from going, being surrounded almost totally by non-Christians uh, to now being around all fellow believers uh, in Bible college. It, it completely shifted things for my life the complete opposite way. Finding a new love for God and His Word, uh, considering how I would spend my free time productively and learning many other lessons there. I'll always be thankful for those years and those times that I was able to, to spend there. So, thinking on this, may we consider our lives and consider who we surround ourselves with as we consider that first verse. So then we come to the second verse. We've heard about what not to do, uh, who we should not spend our time with. But what does a blessed person do? As it says in verse 2, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law he meditates day and night. So rather than listening to the counsel of the wicked, taking advice from unbelievers, the believer is to delight in the law of the Lord. And not only to delight in the law and to delight in His Word, but to meditate on it day and night. Again, thinking on this verse, Origen had this to say about verse 2. He said, The blessed person meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, not as one who entrusts the word of the law to his memory without works, but as one who by meditating performs works consistent with it. So this meditation that is spoken of is not just meditating on it so you know it and have it in your head and memorize it and can recite it. But by meditating on the Lord and His Word is that these works and these things would flow out of it. Flow out of our lives that we are filling our hearts and our minds with as we fill our hearts with His Word. Now this verse sounds very similar to what is written in Deuteronomy. So if you have your Bible, flip with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 19 and 20. You shall teach... So this is a little background before I get right into it. This is as they're given the Ten Commandments, as they're reflecting the laws of the Lord. It's spoken of what they should do with these commandments, these things that they've heard. And it says, You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you're sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So similar to what is said in, in this psalm, that meditating on the law, meditating on it day and night, it's talking about all your life, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when you're sitting down, you're thinking of these laws, thinking of the commandments. And then also flip over to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Again here in Joshua 1, verse 8, it says, 
The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So with these verses, it sounds very similar to what we're looking at in the Psalms here. That as you meditate on it, as you have the book of the law, as you have the commandments, and here as you have the law, that you meditate on it day and night. It's a part of your life. Whatever you're doing, it's a part of your life. And this is a common theme, not only in these three places that we've seen this morning, but throughout the Old Testament, uh, that you can see from these things, uh, that to meditate, to discuss, and to remember the law, that is what the people are commanded to do, that it would be a part of their lives, that God's word would be a part of their lives. So may we consider ourselves, do we take time to reflect on God's Word? Do we meditate on it day and night? Do we teach it to our children? Do we keep it with us as we sit, as we walk and work in free time, in our hobbies? I'm sure the answer could always be not enough. Maybe yes, we do it. Maybe we have grown in it, but not enough. It's sad in some ways because we have more, we have easier access to the Word of God in the West perhaps more than ever before. You can get it on your phone. You can look it up online. You can get it pretty much any bookstore. You can order it from Amazon. Uh, get it free in many places. We have tons of Bibles here at the church. Yet in many ways, even though it is maybe more accessible than ever, it has become less a part of our lives than ever before. But may this not be. Maybe we consider the Word. Maybe we look at what we're encouraged by here to let the word, let God's word, the law, the commandments be more a part of our lives, that we would meditate on it day and night. Whatever we're doing, the word would be a part of our lives. So that is the first two verses that we've looked at there. Now, next we come to the second contrast in verses 3 and 4. Again, between the believer and the unbeliever. Between the blessed man and the, the wicked man. So, let's just read it again as we look at it. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So the man who is blessed is like a tree planted by streams of water yielding its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. What a beautiful picture that is. Just have this tree, this bountiful tree bearing fruit. I know for us, we, as we've had our new house, we've planted a garden. And with the weather, it's been a blessing. I don't call myself a gardener, but to see the way things have grown. There's been so much water, rain, things coming, sun, things just growing like more than I could even believe. Seeing apples growing on the tree. It's been a blessing to see that. What a beautiful picture that is. And, and the people in that day would have been able to imagine that. Living, farming, doing life just having a fruitful, bountiful tree. And there are so many things in this verse that we could look at in depth. These themes that are seen throughout the Bible, pretty much every sentence. But we don't have the time to fully flesh each one of them out. Each one of them could really be a sermon in itself. Consider this tree that's planted by the streams of water, that's connected, it's planted, it's rooted in water. This is a common theme throughout the Bible. Think of the river of life that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. This picture of being connected to water, being connected to Jesus. Then the, a, a tree that is bearing fruit. Again, a common theme that you can see throughout the Bible. You can think of John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you're connected to me, you may bear much fruit. And then think of Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. That those that are connected, that have the Holy Spirit in them, would bear fruit, would bear much fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. We think of what it means to be fruitful as a believer. And then hearing that this tree is healthy, that its leaf does not wither. For the, the withering or the dying tree, or the tree that does not bear fruit, is cast aside, is cut off. You can think of Jesus in the fig tree when the fruit is not on the tree and Jesus condemns the tree. And also if you look at John 15, considering those that bear fruit, but also that those that do not bear fruit are cut off and cast off into the fire. 
So in this verse, there's so much there. We see the consistent biblical picture of one who is living a healthy Christian life. The man who is blessed, who is delighting and meditating on God's law and his word is a true, healthy, fruit-bearing believer and follower of God. So that's just a beautiful picture again in verse 3. And then in verse 4, we hear about the wicked. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind blows away. So rather than being rooted and planted by the water bearing fruit, the wicked are the opposite, completely dead, like chaff, like a, like a tumbleweed blowing in the wind. So who will you be as you consider these words? Will you be the one planted by this stream with your roots deep in God's word and in Christ? Because it's only by being rooted in Christ, on his word, meditating on it day and night with him as our focus that we will be that healthy tree bearing fruit. And now, so we've got the first and the second contrast, these two here, and now we come to the final contrast in verses 5 and 6. It starts with, therefore, and uh, many people, many teachers, professors have said this, or people that study the Bible, you have to consider what is the therefore, therefore. So you need to consider all that has been said in these first four verses, and now it's bringing it to a close, bringing it to a conclusion or a result of what these things that have been said. So because of the ways of the wicked, because of their works, it says they will not stand in the judgment. They will not have a chance to be saved. They will not have a chance to receive eternal life with God, but will receive their due punishment, what is coming to them. Those that choose to reject God and to deny Him will receive their due punishment. They chose to reject God, consciously reject Him. They will receive eternal separation from the God that they chose to deny and reject. Again, those that choose to reject God, to deny Jesus, to deny His sacrifice that we remembered this morning in communion, will not stand with the righteous before God. And here, in looking at these two verses... It's not explicitly said here, but by looking at the contrast that we've seen in all these verses, the righteous versus the wicked, that it makes sense to understand that if the wicked will not stand in judgment and will not be in the congregation with God, then on the other hand, the righteous will stand in the final judgment before God and they will be in congregation with God. For it says the Lord knows their way. The Lord knows the choices that they have made. The Lord knows of their commitment to follow Him. But the ways of the wicked will perish. Again, they'll blow away like chaff, like a tumbleweed in the wind. Their works will be burned up in the end. So, in this short psalm that we've looked at, the contrast is given three times. The blessed and the righteous on the one side, and the wicked or the sinner or the scoffer on the other side. So the question for us today is, where will you be found in the last day? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with his sacrifice that we remembered this morning? For as it says here, the Lord knows the ways of the righteous. He knows and he sees the unseen, the things that maybe we hide deep in our heart. So the question is, what do you desire? Who do you find yourself with? And what are you doing with the time that you have been blessed with? by the Lord. I pray that in the coming days, in the coming weeks, years, months, I pray that our delight may be in the Lord and that our delight may be in the Word, that we would meditate on it day and night as we heard this morning and that He may be our focus and that we may not be distracted by the ways of the world, but that He would be our focus day by day as we live our lives. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you so much for who you are, just for the tremendous blessings you give us each and every day, Lord, the, the, another beautiful day that you have blessed us with this morning. And we thank you for your word, Lord, just for the encouragement it gives us, but also the challenge, Lord, that we can always uh, seek you deeper, Lord, that we would truly try and understand what it means to meditate on your law, on your word day and night, Lord God, and that we would just desire you more and more each day. So we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.